question is therefore resolved in a negative as it is tied. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business, but I remind senators that at 4 p.m. we will be returning to debate on the business of the Senate motions, which may result in divisions. It will interrupt the MPI. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 14 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator O'Neill. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The growing list of people Mr Morrison blames for his own failures, ATAGI, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, state and territory governments, vaccination clinics and Australians themselves for his bungled COVID-19 vaccine rollout and his own ministers for his government's misuse of taxpayer money. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. And I call Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And I rise to speak today on a matter of great public importance. Uh, that you have just outlined in your opening statements there, and that, that is that there is, in fact, a growing list of people and institutes that Mr Morrison blames for his own failures. And how on earth can we expe expect the leader of the nation to correct his mistakes if he can't even own them? We've seen Mr Morrison blame Atagi, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, state territory governments, vaccination clinics and even Australians themselves for what can only be described as a massively bungled COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And his own ministers in the government misuse of taxpayer funds in their response to that national crisis. The consequences of Mr Morrison's failures in this area have a massive impact on my home state of New South Wales. More than half the population woke up this morning under lockdown. For most in New South Wales, it will now be their seventh week and the numbers of cases are rising ever higher. And I want to acknowledge the incredible efforts of the Victorians under the leadership of Mr Andrews, who was absolutely maligned by the Prime Minister at the time, in preventing the spread of illness and disease in the great state of Victoria. But we are in a terrible position in New South Wales. We are in a terrible position in New South Wales now, and sadly, the numbers are increasing. This could have been avoided. All over the developed world, nations with successful vaccination rollouts are returning to life. A very, very different scenario from what we face here in Australia under the leadership of the Liberal National Party, Mr Morrison and his team, his team, who come in here and continue to back him up and back up his excuses and back up his contrasting reality uh, speeches. We, it, the, whole man, the whole thing that the man says is incoherent most of the time. The problem is, with vaccine rollouts unable to happen, we can see a very different life for us here in Australia by comparison to overseas. We can see others across the world seeing concerts, pubs are open and their economies are bouncing back. But why not Australia? Why aren't we returning to normal life? Well, Australia is not returning to the normal life that we all want because Mr Morrison did not build a functioning quarantine system for overseas travels, and he didn't secure a varied and sufficient supply of vaccines. It's as simple as that. But has the Prime Minister taken any responsibility for his decision-making, his failure of leadership for the Australian people? Of course not, because Mr Morrison continues to pretend that he's right every time he steps up to a microphone. And that is why we are finding, over time, he's completely contradicting himself. First, Mr Morrison did not secure enough supply of Pfizer and Moderna because he put all the eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. And of course, it's important to note that that was the cheapest version of 
any sort of protection that we could get. Mr Morrison and Hunt botched the messaging regarding the extremely rare blood clot conditions with AstraZeneca, and of course that led to many people making a decision who actually still believed the Prime Minister at that stage. That you, that, be careful about AstraZeneca. That was the messaging that was coming out of the leadership of this country. And people decided that they would wait for Pfizer. Well, that, what a disaster that's been waiting. And what's happened? We've seen thousands of vials of perfectly good vaccine perish. Again, a failure of leadership by Mr Morrison. I want to be very clear to anybody who might be listening to this. AstraZeneca can protect you from the virus. I've received it. My husband received it. And despite the fact that all my children are in their 20s, I encouraged them and they did their own research and each one of them have also received their first jab of AstraZeneca because they know that they can't rely on this government that botches everything at every turn. They cannot rely on this government to protect them. They have to take, they have to take matters into their own hands. And, uh, um, Mr President, I'm, I'm not distressed by the noise that's coming from the other side of the chamber, because in, in addition to Mr Morrison's denial of reality and his cacophony of uh, excuses, we've got the bleating of those opposite who are backing him in at every turn and saying, he's a great Prime Minister, he's doing a good job, except it doesn't feel like that in New South Wales, let me tell you. It doesn't feel like that for businesses in New South Wales. AstraZeneca can protect you for the right. Who's playing the blame game? You really want to do that question? Order. Accept responsibility. Order. Accept responsibility Senators for the decisions of your Dunham. government. For the decisions of Order. your government. AstraZeneca can protect you from the virus. AstraZeneca is the reason that 75% of the UK is vaccinated, and they are returning to normal life as they knew it before, before the vaccines were rolled out there. The head of the TGA only yesterday said that AstraZeneca has saved dozens of lives every single day since the pandemic started. But Mr Morrison's comments, his, his embroidery, his, his um, profuse language, his hours in front of a microphone have contributed to the confusion and vaccine hesitancy, vaccine complacency across the nation. And when he's called out on it, Instead of saying, actually, I, I did get that wrong, he's, he chose instead to blame. Who did he blame? He blamed the scientists and, this, and, and the Atagi. He actually went to the highest institute in terms of determining what was safe, and Mr Morrison blamed them rather than accepting his own responsibility. Instead of appropriately communicating the risks of AstraZeneca, Prime Minister Morrison blamed Atagi, Australia's top advisory body on immunisation, and tried to bully them into changing their advice on its risk and blame them for the glacial speed of the rollout. And this was despite their rollout being only um, to provide advice, their, their role to ad provide advice, because it's ultimately up to the federal government, run by you know who, to implement that advice. It's no one's fault but the Prime Minister. And if you want to call him Voldemort, I'll take that interjection, Senator Hughes. Go right ahead, the man who won't be named, the man who won't take responsibility for anything. Instead of responsibly securing a supply of Pfizer like Israel, the US and France, Mr Morrison went cheap. And then he botched the negotiations with Pfizer and then blamed them for the lack of supply. The Prime Minister fatefully said, we're not in a race. Now, there is no Australian who can forgive that critical moment, that moment of failure to be a leader, when Mr Morrison decided to say we weren't in a race. He lacks vision for this country. He lacks leadership. He lacks the capacity to own his mistakes. He is a morally flawed individual who's, who is actually putting the whole country at risk by those failures of character. Senior business leaders around the country had to turn to the former Labor Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, to fix the appalling mess after Mr Morrison completely botched the negotiations. Mr Morrison, according to Pfizer, displayed, and I'm quoting here, rude, dismissive and penny-pinching approach in the negotiations, and he only got 10 million doses, and that was four months after other countries had got theirs. He was offered 40 million doses of Pfizer. Australians, remember that. 40 million, 40 million doses was the offer 
that Mr Morrison got last June. And if he had led properly, if he'd taken facts into the decision making instead of his own hubris, we might not be suffering the lockdown in New South Wales that we are suffering now. The Prime Minister is directly responsible for the shortage of Pfizer, directly responsible. But to hear him tell it, it's everyone else's fault but his. Not content with fighting with Pfizer, though, Mr Morrison then blamed the European Union for not delivering them and AstraZeneca for not shipping three million vaccines on the delayed rollout, which the EU, uh, EU pointed out was actually only a number of 250,000 doses. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look in Mr Morrison's comments, there are falsehoods, there are uh, self-congratulatory ex explanations, there is deflection for everyone else who should bear the blame. Anybody, anybody but me, says Mr Morrison, day in, day out. Blame anybody but me. Yet he is the Prime Minister of Australia. This is happening on his watch. This disaster is happening on Mr Morrison's watch, and he is failing the country every single Order, day. Senator O'Neill. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. Well, I think the Australian people, after listening to that contribution, would be thanking goodness, thanking their lucky stars that those opposite are not in the government benches through this terribly challenging time for Australia. The memory of those opposite is extraordinarily poor. The ability to be constructive during one of the biggest challenges that has faced this nation in generations is absent. What do we hear from the other side, apart from carping and negativity? Crickets. Absolutely nothing. They talk about what is happening in the rest of the world and places with vaccine rollouts that are further advanced than Australia's. And we are happy to acknowledge as a government there are countries around the world that have uh, vaccine rollouts further advanced than Australia. But let's just stand back for a moment and look at what is happening in some of those countries. The US, uh, whose, whose vaccine rollout has been lauded uh, uh, by some of those opposite, are currently under, under, under getting uh, detecting 100,000 cases a day, a day, 100,000 cases a day. The UK, Senator O'Neill talked extensively about the AstraZeneca vaccine and its use in the United Kingdom, 20 to 30,000 cases per day. I mean, this is absolutely an extraordinary idea that the Labor Party is putting forward. I will agree with one thing that Senator O'Neill said, and that is that the AstraZeneca is a very good, high-quality vaccine, and I would absolutely encourage everyone out there to talk to, uh, to, talk to their doctor or talk, talk to a medical professional uh, about getting advice on getting the AstraZeneca vaccine if it is available to them. Uh, it, it is a high-quality vaccine, and it, it adds to the repertoire that we have available to us here in Australia, thanks to the methodical approach taken by the Morrison government, the approach led by the health advice. Now, did that approach face some challenges? Absolutely, and we've been upfront with the Australian people about that. Did it face some challenges? Yes, ATAGI did change their advice in terms of age groups as to AstraZeneca. They, they changed their advice twice in actual fact. And in doing so, that did reduce those uh, who could access that vaccine uh, at that time, and there was a perception issue around that. Uh, and there was a perception issue around that as well. I myself, as I've said in this place before, was caught up in that. Uh, I was uh, reg registered to get an AstraZeneca vaccine. The health advice changed. Uh, my vaccine was changed to a Pfizer vaccine. Uh, so uh, obviously that did cause some issues. There was also an issue of some deliveries uh, of vaccines from Italy, I believe, uh, 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 earlier last year, uh, which again hold down our availability, uh, uh, slowed down the availability of doses. But what the Labor Party completely fails to now take into account is what is happening on the ground as we speak. We look at March this year, 770,000 um, vaccines administered. March, uh, 770,000. April, 1.4 million. May, 2.1 million. June, 3.4 million. July, 4.5 million. 
the Australian people can see what this government is delivering, and that is an accelerating vaccine program. Just uh, in the last few days, um, I th think this was the number from, from Monday, from memory, but it's uh, 234,899 doses. That's the daily increase in doses. So a daily increase of 234,000, almost 235,000. So we can see, and now we have added to the repertoire uh, of vaccines available in Australia. Very shortly, we will have the Moderna vaccine available in Australia. Uh, and obviously, that adds another, another uh, quiver to, to, the, um, to our arrows that we have facing this virus. Uh, the Moderna vaccination is a two dose vaccine, four weeks apart. Again, that smaller gap than the AstraZeneca vaccine does help to. Uh, speed up and uh, the rollout of the vaccines across Australia. Ten million of those doses will be in Australia uh, by the end of this year, which again, uh, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see what that will add to the vaccination rollout in this country. So we're going to see a million doses uh, arrive in September. They will go to pharmacies across the country. 3 million in October, 3 million in November and 3 million in December. The Moderna vaccine is safe and effective. And again, this is a message to all Australians out there who are listening, who haven't yet registered, to encourage them to get along. Uh, it's been used, uh, approved for use in Britain, Canada, the European Union, the United States, Switzerland and Singapore. Over 140 million doses have been administered of the Moderna vaccine, that is, in the United States already. Uh, and so we've got a very large body of evidence we have been able to draw on when assessing these vaccines. 93 per cent effective after six months. Of, order. After six Senator Brockman, you'll be in continuation. Pursuant to order, we interrupt for business of the Senate. I'll call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in the name of Senator Dodson relating to disallowance of sections four and six of the Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Persons Instrument 2021. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion uh, num business of Senate number one standing in the name of Senator Dodson and I indicate that some Senator Dodson will respond remotely. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, there are times when we as parliamentarians are called upon to stand up to those uh, most vulnerable in our society, those who are continuously subjected to bad policy but who have the least resources to challenge it. And This is one of such occasions. I'm proud to move this disallowance motion on behalf of Labor. If successful, it will have the effect of ending a harmful compulsory requirement for parents of young children to participate in the government's broken Parent Next program. Currently under this instrument, the program is mandatory for people of par for the parenting payment who have children under the age of six and meet certain criteria like age and period of unemployment. It has the worthy goal of helping parents gain the skills needed for employment by the time their youngest child reaches school age. However, with so many of this government's programs, it has failed grossly in its implementation. Two years after it was rolled out nationally on the back of a very questionable internal evaluation, it has become clear that the Parent Next program is failing parents. Not only that, it's failing and causing great harm to their children. I originally moved the motion in my capacity as a member of the Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights. That committee has just undertaken a thorough and damning inquiry into the instrument that is the subject of this disallowance motion and the, par and the Parent Next program generally. And I urge all my all my colleagues in the chamber to read this bipartisan and unanimous report that the committee tabled last week. 
I consider my membership of the Human Rights Committee as one of my most important roles in the Parliament. And at its best, it operates in a bipartisan way, clearly undertaking its technical task and providing considerable, considered, measured advice to the Parliament about the capabilities of all bills and legislative instruments with human rights. Only rarely, and where the most serious concerns are raised, does the committee undertake the kind of in-depth inquiry it has with the Parent Next program. And the report at table last week demonstrates the serious flaws in the program and the concerns from across the political divide that it is causing harm to vulnerable parents and their children. The committee's unanimous findings are this, and that there is a considerable risk that the compulsory participation in the Parent Next program impermissibly limits human rights, including the rights of the child. And the program's financial sanctions means that a considerable portion of parents are unable to meet their basic needs and those of their children. There are strong findings that cannot be ignored. The committee's unanimous recommendation was that the Parent Next program be made voluntary for parents of children under the age of six. In seeking to disallow this instrument, Labor is giving effect to this bipartisan recommendation. There are several critical pieces of evidence that influence the committee's findings, and I'd like to speak to each. First, the committee heard the program is not effective to achieving its stated objective. Importantly, there has been no independent evaluation of the program next a program. In fact, the department brazenly confirmed there is no intention to conduct one. But the evidence speaks for itself. Of the more than 150,000 parents who participated in Parent Next between the 1st of July 2018 and the 31st of December 2020, just 4,500, 3%, exited the program as a, as a result of finding stable employment. Multiple witnesses reported parents being required to engage in superfluous and unsuitable activities, such as going to the gym or continuing to participate in programs they were already attending. Concernedly, some witnesses even gave evidence of parents who had cause to drop out of self-initiated tertiary or other education due to the other onerous requirements imposed by the Parents Next program. Even more, the committee report expresses the serious concern that participants are being pushed into jobs which are predominantly low paid, casual and insecure. How will that be effective in breaking cycles of disadvantage? Second, there is a considerable, there was considerable evidence that the program is doing serious harm to parents and their children. One third of the participants in the Parent Next program have had their parenting payments suspended under the program a compliance framework for an average of five days, five days without an income, with approximately half of parenting payments recipients living in financial hardship Many parents whose payments are suspended will be unable to meet their own basic needs and those of their own children. Despite this, the government provides no evidence that either a formal or informal assessment of a person's capacity to meet their basic needs or those of their children is undertaken before these parenting payments are suspended, reduced or cancelled. In fact, the picture painted through the committee's inquiry was of a rigid, inflexible bureaucracy imposing punitive sanctions with devastating impacts on families and children. Anyone with a skerrick of empathy can imagine the panic on the face of a parent with having their meagre income cut off suddenly, of having to see through five days of rent and meals without a cent or a penny, or having no explanation to kids where the, that there's no money for food or other basics. 
So many of the witnesses to the committee gave evidence of the crisis families were thrown, thrown into when suspension occurred. Ms. Therese Edwards, CEO of the National Council for Single Mothers and Their Children, told a harrowing story of a young Indigenous woman from Toowoomba. She said she needed a letter from the hospital explaining how unwell her child was to get an exemption from the program activities. The letter was three to four days late coming because of the nature of the local hospital. In the interim, her income was suspended. She had no money for food and petrol was limited. When she phoned the service, they only had an answering machine as an option. It was a fly-in, fly-out type service. Luckily, the council managed to get her some emergency funding to keep her through, to help her through, uh, and to get the suspension lifted. What kind of program cuts payments to a, to a mother of a sick child? Finally, the committee also examined the disproportionality and discriminatory impact of the program on women and First Nations parents. 95% of the program participants are women, most of them single mothers. 18% are First Nations parents. Concerning First Nations parents, also make up 31% of the participants who receive a detriment under the compliance scheme. Parents experiencing domestic violence are at particular risk if their payments are cut off under the scheme. As Ms. Kavanagh Kinez of Zoe Support Australia recounts, and I quote, I have a young client who, has, who was experiencing family violence and had to flee from her home and became homeless, and as a result of that financially, was not able to keep up with her payments to her phone plan, so her phone was disconnected. Then because of the, she wasn't answering the phone calls on the Parent Next program, her payments were suspended. This is not the kind of country we are. We can do better than this. In fact, we must do better than this for the many single mothers who are raising future generations without financial support. It doesn't have to be this way. Crucially, the committee's report found that making the program compulsory only marginally benefits compared with two different times when, participant, when participation was voluntary, including during the pandemic lockdowns last year. The committee concluded if Parent Next was voluntary, it could promote a range of human rights and no human rights would be, in, would be limited. This is exactly what this disallowance will achieve. The government will no doubt try to argue that it would be dangerous and disruptive. But it's their responsibility to fix up their own broken program. And only an incompetent, arrogant government would ignore the carefully considered views of their own backbench to retain this program in its current form. I urge all my colleagues in the chamber to support this disallowance. Thank you, Senator Dodson. Senator Seaworth. Thank you. I rise to um, speak to, on the disallowance of sections four and six of the Social Security Parent and Payment Participation Requirements class of persons uh, uh, legislative instrument. And indicate we will be supporting this disallowance. Parents Next is a degrading, punitive and coercive program and it has to go. I in fact tried to disallow this program back in 2018 and, it was de and it's devastating to think of the harm this program has caused since then. I hope this time this disallowance will be successful. It is now, unfortunately, had these three years to run, and we have seen the harm that it has caused. This program disrespects women and has negative impacts on children. This motion today would abolish certain classes of compulsory parents' next participants. It provides us with an opportunity to listen to the community and make parents' next voluntary, and I urge the government to do so. Throw away your ideological obsession with mutual obligations and, and support this disallowance. Parents Next devalues the role of parenting and unpaid caring responsibilities. It look, overlooks the gender division of labour and the amount of labour single mothers do day in, day out. It punishes and stigmatises single mothers. It should never have been mandatory in the first place. Some Parents Next participants are especially vulnerable. 
the women, women affected by domestic violence, those who experience mental ill health and First Nations mothers are deeply affected by this program. Women describe feeling insulted and degraded and, degraded and having the joy drained out of activities that, they were previously, that were previously meaningful to them. They describe the weight and burden of having onerous mutual obligation requirements to meet. The Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights found, as Senator Dodson has just outlined, that compulsory participation in Parents Next does limit human rights. This is particularly the case for people who have had their parenting payment reduced, suspended or cancelled. If Parents Next is made voluntary, then the government won't be limiting people's human rights. We can invest in supportive programs. The constant threat of having their payment suspended can have devastating, devastating impacts on parents' mental health. I can only imagine the impact that this has then on children, particularly seeing their parents so distressed. People who, have most likely, who are most likely to face payment suspension include people with intellectual disability, people with mental ill health, people experiencing homelessness, domestic violence or parents of children with high care needs. The evidence presented to the latest inquiry and throughout other inquiries that have been done into this program is clear. The benefits do not outweigh the immediate and long-term harms caused by the Parents Next program. The women who have been subjected to this punitive program know best, and it's time to listen to them. Properly listen. Interviews undertaken by Dr Elise Klein provide insight into the punitive and harmful nature of parents next. One mother told Dr Klein, the conditionality is like a new violent relationship, financial and psychologically abusive. Another woman said, um, with a high needs daughter said, it's not that I'm sitting at home watching telly on my bum, not happening. I'll welcome you to come and watch me. See how busy a single mum's life gets with no family support because it's very different to having family here where you can leave the kids with the grandma and then go and or have a partner you can safely co-parent with. That's not the case. Another woman living um, regionally talked about the stigma she had experienced. It is an echo chamber, but that's what happens a lot when you're a single mum. You're stigmatised into the, it's a harsh word, but the useless pile. You've never go, you're never going to amount to anything because you've ruined your whole life by not having a husband. We're societal lepers. Parents Next has done enough damage. The only people who perhaps are calling for this program to be compulsory are the providers who know there is money to be made from these enforced requirements, money to be made out of participants in the program, out of single mothers. On a fundamental level, Parents Next does not address the most significant barriers parenting payment recipients face, a payment that is below the poverty line. Lack of access to childcare to facilitate work and study and high effective ta marginal tax rates that provide a disincentive to re-enter the workforce by taking on part-time paid work. The government must act now to make parent next voluntary. No more punitive requirements and no more payment suspensions. I ask, in fact beg, the crossbench to support this motion. Parents need to be supported to raise the next generation. Parenting is so important. And this government, who I understand values the role of parents, undermines that with this program. Government, vote with the, rest, with the opposition, with the Greens, who we've campaigned on this since this program began, and hopefully the crossbench and make this program voluntary so it can actually do what you claim that it is in designed to do, which is to help parents, and in particular is predominantly the number of, parents in, um, a number of parents on this program are women, to help those women. You are harming them with this program. We will be supporting this disallowance. Senator Dunian. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, the Morrison government is committed to ensuring that parents receive the assistance that they need to prepare for employment by the time their children reach school age. 
We understand for many people, particularly for women, becoming a parent can involve more time spent caring for children and less time in the paid work, uh, workforce. Parents Next is ensuring the best opportunity for parents to reach their education and employment goals, well placing them uh, to be job ready by the time their children start school. Since 2018, Parents Next has assisted over 161,000 parents, with more than 74,000 parents commencing education and almost 40,000 parents commencing employment. The proposed disallowance will fundamentally undermine this program. Uh, thank you. The, the question before the chair is the motion in the name of Senator Dodson being the disallowance of sections four and six of the Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Persons Instrument 2021. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against? No. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the disallowance in the name of, of Senator Dodson, uh, being sections four and six of the Social Security Parenting Payment Participation Requirements Class of Persons Instrument 2021. The ayes will move the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart Tiller for the ayes and Senator Smith Tiller for the noes. The result of the division is I 16, no 16. The votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. Senators will be returning uh, to the MPI, and Senator Brockman will be in continuation. While that is happening, I'll ask that senators please uh, leave the chamber if they're not intending to stay and to leave the chamber in an orderly and quiet fashion. And Senator Brockman, you have the call. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, as I was uh, discussing uh, before the interruption, uh, I was talking about the recent uh, approval of the Moderna vaccine in Australia, in particular the fact that uh, 140 million doses have been administered in the United States alone. Uh, you know, that is quite a massive uh, evidence base and gives us Australians uh, a lot of certainty that this is a vaccine that is well worth considering, along with Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Uh, in fact, as I, as I stated, it's, um, evidence so far shows that it remains some 93 per cent effective six months after the second dose, 100 per cent effective at preventing death caused by COVID-19. And, and, and I would urge all those who are weighing up um, the benefits of vaccination um, to consider that statistic when making their decision. Um, it, it, I would obviously urge everyone, particularly in my home state of Western Australia, to, um, to look at the vaccines that are available, to talk to their doctors if they have any level of uncertainty, um, to talk to medical professionals, but to get vaccinated. All the vaccines are of very high quality, all offer very good protection, and, uh, and I would certainly urge them, to, if, they, um, if they can get into a um, into a vaccination centre uh, as we speak, then to do so with Pfizer and AstraZeneca. Um, and as of next month, uh, Moderna will also become part of the suite of tools available and the choices that people have. Now, we continue, as I stated earlier, to take a very methodical science-based approach. And that has uh, been seen in our vaccination rollout. Uh, we have listened to the health advice when the health advice changed, as I said. Um, that did cause some issues with the vaccination rollout, particularly with AstraZeneca, but we listened to the health advice and we responded accordingly. Uh, and now we continue to listen to the health advice and are taking a science-based approach by developing the national plan. Uh, the Doherty Institute 
um, obviously has done um, much work on that, um, and the plan was developed and uh, uh, developed in line with that work conducted by the Doherty Institute. It sets out very clearly the four-phased response to the pandemic, beginning with the pre-vaccination phase and ending with the post-vaccination phase. Uh, Australians can see that we have been through. We are in phase uh, A and we continue to suppress the virus for the purpose of minimising community transitions, uh, transmission while we vaccinate. Once we've reached 70 per cent of vaccinational, vaccinations in eligible 16 years of age or older population, we move to phase 1B. At phase B, phase B, the vaccine, vaccination transition phase, we seek to maintain the high vaccination rate and minimise serious illness and hospitalisation. And again, I will point out that, um, that the vaccines, the three vaccines or two vaccines and, and one about to come on stream, a third vaccine about to come on stream, all offer uh, very good protection against this virus. And uh, I would urge all my fellow citizens, uh, I have had my first dose, I get my second dose next week, I urge everyone to uh, register for their vaccination as soon as they possibly can. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Seward. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this MPI, um, which is effectively an MPI, an MPI in the government's um, failure to deliver on the va vaccine rollout in a, an effective and timely manner. Um, this is the rollout that wasn't a race and that now is a race, and in particular it's a race for government to try and justify um, their slowness in this and to try and roll back what we were having a race about in the first place. As Delta becomes the dominant variant in Australia, we are seeing more and more young people getting and transmitting COVID. It's clear that the virus is finding a way to infect younger groups, which is in fact what was expected in terms of the mutations and the new of the virus and the new um, variants. While the risk of, of death is low for younger people, it's evident that if more younger people become infected, there will be there will develop more will develop more serious illness and potentially die. Man many. Um, may in fact also go on to experience long COVID, and we don't know uh, what impacts long COVID uh, will have on uh, young people, um, for, and in particular those uh, particularly young people, whether it will be with them all their lives. Today, Dr Kerry Chant said New South Wales is seeing a number of childcare centre outbreaks and urging parents to keep their children out of childcare if possible. Dr Chant said children can in many ways transmit between themselves. We don't have a clear picture of long-term uh, long impacts of COVID on children. Scientists are racing to find the answer. But why would we want to take a risk and expose young children, young people and children um, to COVID in the first place? Modelling by the Doherty Institute clearly shows the devastating consequences of not including kids under 16 years um, old in our vaccination targets. They, they make a number of predictions around if we reach 70 per cent vaccination coverage for over 16s. Um, and Doherty predicts that 350,000 children under 16 um, getting infected with COVID and 3,000 children under 16 getting admitted to hospital with, 200 and, with COVID and 280 children under 16 admitted to ICU. Nobody in this country wants to see that. These figures are so high. The reason these figures are so high is because the government has excluded kids from our vaccination targets. It's absolutely essential that we include kids in our vaccination targets. And the Grattan Institute actually modelled children under 16 or people under young people under 16 um, in the models. We need to sound the alarm bells about the risks the government is taking by only limiting and only aiming to vaccinate 70 per cent of our um, population over 70 per cent over the age of 16. That actually is 56 per cent of the whole population. We need to make sure our vaccination pro program is covering young people under the age of 16. It's absolutely critical to ensure 
that we get effective vaccination of the whole population. It's another failure of this program that the government is not more actively pursuing vaccinating children under the age of 16. This is the reason I've asked or put an um, order for production of documents, is to get an idea and to understand what the brief was to the Doherty Institute. Why aren't people, young people under the age of 16, being included in our vaccination targets? They should be, Senator and it's Seward, outrageous they're not. Your time has expired. Senator Polly, remotely. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, when a country is in crisis, whether it's at war or when there's a pandemic, which we are experiencing now, the Prime Minister of the day would normally rise to the occasion and develop the leadership skills that a country needs. But unfortunately, our Prime Minister has failed miserably. First, he attacked Mr Andrews in Victoria for his short, sharp, effective lockdowns. All he could do, and my colleagues from the other side were coming to the Senate chamber day after day, being ridiculing uh, Mr Andrews and rolling out the, the lines about how in New South Wales they had the roll gold standard of how to deal with the pandemic. Mr Morrison has failed on every count. He established the National um, Cabinet to deal with the pandemic as a way of trying to share the blame around. He's blamed the um, scientists. He's blamed the vaccine manufacturers. He blames everyone else for his failure. He has people on his own back bench who are causing issues now with whether or not master effective way of stopping the spread of this very, very serious COVID-19 and in particular the Delta strain. He has failed to address these backbenchers. He has failed to accept responsibility for the failure of his aged care minister, his health minister. He had two jobs during this pandemic. One was to roll out and secure enough vaccines for all Australians to prevent uh, the tragedies that we see unfolding in New South Wales at this very time with people dying. He also had the responsibility of setting up vaccines and quarantine. He has failed on that count. We knew from the outset that hotel quarantine was never going to work, but no, he blamed the states once again. He blamed the security officers, he blamed everyone. Well, the buck firmly stops with you, Prime Minister. You're the captain of the ship. You told the Australian community that there was no race. We didn't have to panic about not having the vaccines rolling out in a timely way. But this is a race. This is a race to save people's lives. Now, we saw last year so many older Australians dying from COVID-19 because of the failings of the aged care minister. What we see now is young people <coughs> dying from COVID-19, and my heart goes out to their families. But when a Prime Minister has a minister who has failed in health, a minister who has failed as the aged care minister, and he has to bring in the army, that is only reinforcing that he has failed to show the leadership that we desperately need in this country. You have backbenchers going out, causing hysterica about whether or not this is really worse than the flu, whether you should wear a mask or you shouldn't wear a mask. The buck stops with you, Prime Minister. You failed to secure enough vaccines. In my home state of Tasmania, over the weekend, they were advised that, yes, you will be able to, as of next Monday, to vaccinate people in your community through some of your pharmacies. Here we are on Wednesday afternoon and we still do not know who has been approved by the Commonwealth and the state Liberal government to be able to give those uh, jabs in the arm in your local pharmacy. We don't even know which pharmacy. So how can anyone apply to make an appointment to get that jab? Once again, you know, it just proves that Scott Morrison is all about the spin, the photo opportunities, but no follow-up. He has failed, just as he did last year with the bushfires. 
oh, it's, it's just too hard and I don't hold the hose and he flew off to Hawaii. Well, I'm sorry, when you have the job of being Prime Minister, you have to take your responsibilities. And people respect the fact if you own up and say, look, I stuffed up. We didn't buy enough vaccines. We haven't rolled it out. Our ministers have failed. Sack the Minister for Health, sack the Minister for Aged Care and put in people who can do the job. But you failed even to do that. Scott Morrison, people in this country are depending on you, vulnerable people, young people. You have failed people over and over again. It's about time you stepped up because this is a race and every hurdle that you are trying to get over, you failed. Senator it's time Polly, for a new captain your time of the team. has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. So I guess it helps that I find Bill Murray more funny than annoying, because I'm pretty sure that we've all slipped into some sort of a Senate version of Groundhog Day. But unfortunately for those opposite, they, they really haven't seemed able to adapt. And as we come back day after day after day, they still seem to be stepping in that puddle. But let's go through it again for those that are still struggling with the maths, the meaning of the word exponential, and those still clinging to the notion that somehow their role is to pull Australia down, to confuse and mislead the Australian public and contribute to vaccine misinformation and hesitancy. Yesterday, we saw just shy of 256,000 vaccinations delivered. That is over a quarter of a million vaccinations in one day. One day. And these record days, they just keep coming. So now we're at a situation where we have 45 per cent of eligible Australians have received their first dose. So getting very close to 50 per cent, and as we hit those quarter million, dollar, quarter million jabs days, it's going to be here before you know it. But with the second dose, we've now hit 23 per cent. Again, almost a quarter of all eligible Australians have now been fully vaccinated. Not that you'll hear a word from those opposite. But I am glad that Senator Farrell and Senator Chisholm are sitting down because there are a couple of things that I, I kind of almost agree with you on. You know, there was delays in getting the vaccines approved. I think they did take a little bit long. We know that some of the vaccines were being administered overseas quicker than they are here. They were being rolled out faster than they are here. But that was because we had an independent TGA process that wasn't pushed through. There were no shortcuts. We didn't look to to circumnavigate it somehow and get them out quickly. And the reason for that, because unlike the US, unlike what was happening in Europe and the UK, we weren't seeing hundreds of thousands of people dying. We weren't seeing these outbreaks that were affecting hundreds and thousands of people every single day. We, we actually had a bit of time to make sure we went through the processes. And I can only imagine what the lot over the other side would have been going on with had we skipped those steps. Had we cut a corner, had we sped it through, the outcry would have been deafening. But of course, these people don't remember that. Their memory is incredibly short. In fact, Groundhog Day, perhaps it's better to resemble them to a bunch of goldfish. Because I've got to be honest, I am actually quite confused, as I'm sure most of my colleagues on this side are, you know, what you actually want, what you actually do support. What you actually do think should have happened, because you know, no one knows, because you swap and change and move around and twist and turn at every second of the day. I mean, I heard a claim about guinea pigs today, and when we talk about the proper processes of authorisation and approving the vaccines, I'm not quite sure where that even came from. But as you move into your perpetual whine and you try and find your next line of attack based on fallacy, based on misleading information. I just thought I'd go through a couple of the interjections today we heard in question time. So Senator Wong called out, I think it may have been to one of my interjections, and I appreciate the president's ruling that all interjections are unruly but, uh, and out of order, but Senator Wong claimed over the chamber to me that we were 12 months behind. Now, I don't even know how this is possible, and I know maths isn't your strong suit. I know we struggle a little bit over there with the numbers. but. The first vaccine was approved for emergency use in the US on the 11th of December 2020. Now, to anyone's maths, that's eight months ago. So if Senator Wong can you know, just inform the chamber how we're 12 months behind the vaccine rollout when it wasn't even there, 
I, you know, I mean, I realise you guys talk in, in uh, you know, myths, truths, and misleading information. But you know, one fact every now and then wouldn't hurt you. And I mean, for those opposite that don't understand, this vaccine has been developed and approved and rolled out in record speed. Record speed. The pandemic started what February, March last year. The shortest time previous to these COVID-19 vaccines that a vaccine was developed, approved and started to be administered was four years, and that was for the mumps, and that was the fastest vaccine ever. This one's been done in absolute record time, and in fact, the operation was called Operation Warp Speed. But some of us that have memories longer than the goldfish Remember how much you guys weren't, weren't happy with that. You felt that the vaccines were being pushed through. You weren't happy with the new technology, certainly not the mRNA, because that was new. Couldn't have that. But now, all of a sudden, it, there's not enough of it. We didn't buy it before it was approved. We didn't buy it before it had been tested. We certainly didn't buy it before it had gone through TGA processes. You would have been over there complaining had we spent all this money on a vaccine that then didn't get approved. But never let your facts get in the way of a good scare campaign, as we know you guys are so fond of. So, as per usual, those oppor opposite are about as clear as the Mihai after a flood. You're as clear as the Mihai after the flood and as full as much rubbish and old debris as well. So I thought maybe we should invite those opposite to commit in writing some of the answers to these questions. Not only so perhaps some of us and the rest of the Australian people can get some clarity as to what you actually think, but that it might actually serve as a little reminder for you when you need to go back and check, well, hang on, what did I actually think about this a month ago, a week ago, yesterday, 10 minutes ago? Because I'm not quite sure consistency is any of your strong suit. But I am intrigued to find out whether or not now we're going to see another. AZ type fear scaremongering campaign because there's a third vaccine in the mix. And I think, uh, in homage to the member for Goldstein, and as I assume those guys opposite are participating in a Jimmy Reese form of comedy skit, that we should be seeing these fear campaigns rolled out using the correct pronunciation of whether or not we prefer the Pfizer or the modern A. Because you guys, I think, are clearly trying to participate in some form of comedy act because you're certainly not working in any form of fact. You do know anything about the difference between the Moderna and the Pfizer? Do you understand any of the difference other than the brand name? But I can tell you what I know, and I can tell you what anyone with a reading level above grade three knows, is that all vaccines are effective. All of them. All vaccines are effective. All of the vaccines are at the highest safety level. And all of the vaccines are hundreds and thousands of times less likely to kill or injure you than COVID. So just get vaccinated. Stop going out there with your brand-based scare campaigns. So you and your mates, Jeanette Young, Norman Swan, the guy who's not even a doctor, Bill Botel, just go away. You are less correct than a broken watch most days. And so, you know, maybe I'm just feeling kind. It's Wednesday, we're in pink, maybe we're a bit warm. But you know, here's another shocker for you. I want to say well done, Dan Andrews. Good on you, Dan. Premier of Victoria out there telling young people to go get the AstraZeneca. Absolutely supporting the AZ, Australian jobs, Australian manufacturing, effective vaccine, plenty of it around. Let's get out there and get it in those arms. Now, I'm not a big fan of the Premier of Victoria. I'm not sure you know, whether his lockdown route's really the one we want to go down. Brothels, not families. You know, it's, all, it's all a bit unclear about how uh, Victoria's really been doing about this. But his calls on the AD is spot on. But perhaps he's really just backing in that his Victoria mate, the member for Maribyrnong, who's currently in the process of resurrecting Lazarus-style his leadership ambitions. But to everyone in New South Wales, there's now hubs and buses out there. Love it. Get them out. So good. You know what? Park them on the corners. Park them in the shopping centres. And just because I know how much you love it that they're still open in New South Wales, park them in a Bunnings car park. Go and get your sea salt for your veggie patch. You can't get your sausage sandwich, but go get a vaccine. Every time you pop into Bunnings, you can get shot one and shot two. 
Gosh, imagine how many people would be vaccinated at that rate. But I would like to give a shout out in particular today, particularly to the, the pop-up clinic that's occurring uh, in Sydney LGA that I live in, in uh, Redfern and Waterloo, providing from today between 10 and 4, every day through to Saturday, the AstraZeneca for anyone 18 or over, anyone who wants it. It's very clearly advertised as well, I'd just like to say, that it is the AstraZeneca. So that when we see on Sunday the ABC report, because they managed to find one guy who turned up and then have a whinge because he thought he was coming to get the Pfizer, it's the AZ. It's very well publicised. Very well publicised, AstraZeneca available. So for everyone in that red firm Waterloo area, in a, in a city, in a city of Sydney, around the eastern suburbs, make sure you get yourself over to Woolamaloo Water, Water, uh, and, and Waterloo to get that vaccine. Because as the great Richo acknowledged, we Senator need to do Hughes, whatever your it takes. time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The subject is blame, and I'll return to that in a minute, but I can't let the previous speaker's comments go. These vaccines have been provisionally approved because the testing is not complete, because the TGA admits it sees merit in bypassing the testing procedures because of perceived urgency. That is it. They are provisionally approved. They are not fully tested. They rely on the manufacturer's recommendations and manufacturer's testing. That's it. At the same time, we see a proven drug, proven safe, proven now effective in clinical trials, in practical real-world trials in many countries. We see it actually treating COVID su successfully, curing COVID successfully, and being a prophylactic to prevent COVID and to prevent the transmission. That drug is ivermectin. It's been on. It's been approved in many countries for 60 years. It's been given 3.7 billion doses around the world. It's been approved in this country since 2013 for treating various illnesses. It has not been approved for COVID. There are doctors now wanting to use it. There are some doctors actually using it because they're so concerned about people's health. So what we've got, we've got, we've got a, a situation in which a minister is, is bypassing some empirical evidence overseas, clinical trials, and yet ignoring them could really change the situation in this country. It would change it, just as it has in India and other countries. And in the meantime, all we've got is a blame game, exactly as this motion says. But the blame game is not just from the prime minister, it's from state premiers, state bureaucrats, health ministers, prime ministers, federal ministers, and in the meantime, no one is talking about oh, the people's Senator needs. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Um, Senator Walsh, remotely. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and Prime Minister Morrison must be allergic to responsibility, judging by the lengths that he goes to to avoid facing a problem and doing something about it. I wonder if he checked the job description before he decided to stick his hand up to be Prime Minister, because if he did, he should know that the first job of being Prime Minister is to keep Australians safe. Not photo ops, not slogans, not money from mates, keeping Australians safe. Time and again, we see that when the Prime Minister fails to do his job, he looks for someone else to blame. Lockdowns caused by leaks from hotel quarantine, well, blame the state premiers. Low vaccination rates, well, blame the health advisors, blame the Australian people. Continued outbreaks in aged care facilities blame the essential workers. But the people of Australia know who is really responsible. Who has failed to deliver a national purpose-built quarantine system? It's Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Who has failed to order enough vaccines and instead decided that it wasn't a race? Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Who has failed to get aged care staff vaccinated by Easter? Again, Prime Minister Scott Morrison. This is who we have leading the biggest national health response 
in 100 years. A Prime Minister who blames low-paid, essential and insecure workers in aged care rather than doing what is necessary to keep people safe. Four months after he promised every aged care worker would be vaccinated, only one third have received both doses because there just weren't enough vaccines to give them. Then he pinned the blame on the aged care workers. He set a deadline for them to get vaccinated or leave the jobs that they love. But then he went to ground when it came to doing his part. He didn't ensure supply. He didn't ensure that it would get to the workers. He didn't ensure that they could access the vaccines that they need. The Senate Select Committee on Job Security recently heard evidence from aged care workers and employers about just how hard it has been to get vaccinated. Employers reported that it wasn't staff hesitancy but lack of access to vaccines, which were delaying the rollout. Mr Gregory Reeve, CEO of Heritage Care said, and I quote, it's been the accessibility. There doesn't seem to be a significant reluctance to getting vaccinated. It has been about access to the particular drugs required. And Carolyn Smith from the United Workers Union also outlined the barriers that aged care workers face. She said, and I quote, imagine a worker who lives in an outer metro area and works across two different facilities, sometimes up to 50 hours per week, all at the times when immunisation clinics or GP clinics are open. She was told that there was going to be a Commonwealth run vaccination in her facility. And when she turned up, she was told it was only for residents and only if there were leftovers would she get the vaccination. Aged care workers have been trying. They have been trying to get vaccinated as required by the National Cabinet. But they have been trying to get access to vaccines that don't exist at times GPs are open and that hubs are open. Without urgent action, what hope do they have? Prime Minister Morrison has failed on aged care vaccinations. He failed to ensure staff have access to the vaccinations they need. He failed to meet his Easter deadline. And I wonder exactly who is going to blame when he fails to meet his new reworked September deadline. When aged care workers trying to do the right thing with no support are faced with losing their jobs. In crisis, Australia needs a real leader. Instead, Prime Minister Morrison has shown he is prepared to throw anyone under the bus to avoid his responsibility. Even Liberal state premiers, even the health advisers, even the people of Australia, even the dedicated and essential and hardworking aged care workers of this country. He has shown that he won't even take responsibility for members of his own government. So how can we call him a leader when he allows members of his own government to spout dangerous misinformation Senator on Walsh, critical your health time advice? has expired. Senator Carr, a uh, scar, I mean, Senator Scar. I uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And as I always say, when uh, when that stumble occurs, I take it as a compliment, not a uh, not My an insult. Uh, this is the second MPI I've spoken on. Uh, this week, and it's somewhat sad that uh, the content hasn't improved. We're meant to be debating matters of public interest, and from my perspective, Madam Acting Deputy President, I don't think the public is particularly interested in a blame game taking place. I think the public expects that those in a positions of authority take responsibility with respect to matters within their authority. I think the public also expects that those who wish to criticise people in positions of public authority, whatever the position is, whether or not they be a prime minister or a premier uh, or a senior public servant, I think people have a reasonable expectation that those who are critical also put forward constructive suggestions and ideas. I don't think the public is interested. I don't think there is any public interest in a blame game occurring in this place. I think the public is more interested in looking forward in terms of looking for solutions. This section of debate 
shouldn't be simply about political point scoring. It's an opportunity to debate a matter of public interest. It's an opportunity to provide constructive suggestions and advice, and it's an opportunity to, I think, soberly reflect on the current situation and look forward um, in terms of promoting solutions. In terms of this debate, I just want to again. I, I gave this quote on Monday when I first, when I spoke in the first MPI I spoke on during this week, and I'll say it again. This is a quote from our Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Quote: "I take the responsibility for the early setback in our vaccination program." End quote. I take the responsibility for the early setback in our vaccination program. End quote. That's the quote. That, no, it's a, there were no buts. I take the responsibility for the early setback in our vaccination program. End quote. There was no. There was no. However, he also said, Senators, "I'll take the interjection Sen from Senator Wish Wilson." I'll take the. It's very. It's disorderly to interject, and it's, and I would ask Senator Scar not to take the inter, uh, disorderly interjection. Okay. Just continue, I'll, I'll wait, Senator I'll wait, Scar. I won't take the. I won't take the disorderly interjection. Uh, he also said, the Prime Minister did also say, that he should also take responsibility for the positive things that have happened. And I think that's quite a fair and reasonable position to take. But he did say, I take the responsibility for the early setback in our vaccination program. End quote. And I think that should be recognised. It was in part recognised by Senator Wish Wilson in his disorderly uh, interjection, which I'm not going to respond to. Madam Acting Deputy President, but at least it was partly recognised by Senator Wish Wilson. But it's a bit unfortunate that it hasn't been recognised by any other previous speaker in terms of this debate. So the Prime Minister did take responsibility. It's fit and proper he take responsibility. We have a Westminster system, and, and the Prime Minister should take responsibility. But having said that, having said that, as we all know, in terms of something as complicated as a vaccine roll out in a country like Australia by the Commonwealth Government, it isn't government by soliloquy. It isn't government by a single individual. There's whole, there's whole departments of people involved in terms of, this, in terms of this process. There are the scientific advisers. There is a target. There's the Scientific Advisory Council, which was giving advice with respect to what vaccine should be ordered in the program. And there was the medical advice coming from experts. And I say to everyone, I say to everyone who may be listening to this, please take your advice from the medical experts. Please take your advice from the medical experts. They're the people who you should be listening to, your local GP, your local pharmacist, and the medical experts. Take advice from the experts. And the Prime Minister did that. The Prime Minister did that as the Australian people would expect him to do. And we're in the position we're now in. We're in the position we're now in. The Prime Minister has taken responsibility. It's extraordinarily pleasing that, in terms of the rollout, there has been a material acceleration, and that, if those opposite were being reasonable, should be recognised. That the first million Senator vaccines Scar, took 45 days to roll out. Your time has expired, Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I think the one thing Australians can be sure about in this time of uh, of chaos uh, and complexity is that the one race that our Prime Minister will win and would win under any circumstances how fast you can run away from responsibility. And I just hope at the next election, which will no doubt be in the next nine months, that the Australian people run as fast as they can away from this government and vote with their feet. Now, I want to say that when I heard uh, Senator Cash talking at question time today, the coalition asked themselves a question, how many terror attacks have they foiled uh, since 2014? Um, I noted that because it's usually a sign that they've hit political rock bottom, when that's what they've got to start talking about. Uh, I read in uh, Malcolm Turnbull's book over Christmas, uh, with interest, uh, his discussion about Tony Abbott's reign of terror in this place, hiding behind the flag, uh, you know, trying to uh, throw this out there to amongst the Australian people, because it is a government's number one role to protect its citizens. But it is absolutely failed to do that with this vaccine rollout. This is a major crisis, 
and their government has failed to protect the Australian people. So it's no wonder they're going back to questions they haven't asked themselves for years about foiling terror attacks. And what about climate change, the biggest threat we face? Well, yesterday was all the evidence you need that this government has also failed to protect the Australian people and its duty of care for future generations. Mr Barnaby Joyce said just this morning on the radio, we don't actually have to come up with a plan for climate change in 2050, just like they haven't come up with a plan for vaccinating this country. This government is a mess, Acting Deputy President, and we need to bring a broom. Uh, thank, you, that from Senate, a... thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Ciccone, remotely. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and I'd also like to just thank uh, Senator O'Neill for bringing this matter before the chamber today, because it is indeed a matter of the greatest public importance in our country um, and in her home state, New South Wales, uh, considering there are now more regional parts of New South Wales in lockdown. Um, Madam Mackin, Deputy President, uh, as I speak to you now, I'm doing so from a city under lockdown yet again. There are some 5 million people in Melbourne all of whom are for most of their part currently confined to their homes, free to leave for barely a few hours a day for their daily exercise. Now, sadly, this has been the reality for Melbournians for quite some time now and may very well be for some time yet. But it is not just Melbourne that is affected by the latest wave of transmission. As we know, Sydney and Brisbane and Adelaide all have experienced lockdowns of their own in recent weeks. And in the case of Sydney, we may very well see their, their lockdown continue for weeks, if not months. Whilst there is no doubt that the multitude of factors has meant that the circumstances that we are currently living in, um, there is equally no doubt that the most significant among them has been this government's failure to deliver on the vaccine rollout. And one would have thought that in such a case that the government would take responsibility for such failure. Certainly, this is what we have had to see from previous governments. And I wonder if any of us could envisage former Prime Ministers ducking and running and finger pointing at everyone else under the sun, as this Prime Minister has, whether it be Atagi or Pfizer, AstraZeneca, state and territory governments, vaccine clinics or working Australians, everyone has some burden of the blame to share, except, except the Prime Minister himself, of course, because he seems to blame everyone else. Now, as bad as this rollout is in our major cities, however, we must not forget that the challenges are greater in regional and remote communities. We already know that those in regional and remote communities have poorer health outcomes than those in metropolitan areas, and this is not something that is new. Those of us in this place who have lived in regional areas or travelled to them extensively know full well the extent of this problem. Doctors frequently coming and going, clinics not always open, specialists some hundred kilometres away. Now, these systemically poor health outcomes have meant that Australians in the country are inherently more vulnerable to COVID. And as a result, it is these Australians that have the highest price to pay for the government's vaccine failure. It is these Australians that will feel the health repercussions of this most prominently. Australians in regional and remote communities cannot afford further failure. They cannot afford more buck passing and finger pointing. What they need is outcomes, not excuses. And as reported in the Herald Sun today, Victorian doctors are administering fewer than half as many vaccine doses compared to their New South Wales counterparts every single day, leaving my home state behind in the race to meet the targets to reopen. Sadly, this is a government that is more interested in laying blame at the feet of others than getting on with the job of delivering for our community. I lament this and share the disappointment, disappointment of my fellow Victorians who may them, themselves live through our country Victoria and feel let down and at risk because of this government's decision making. Whilst I cannot promise them that this government eventually step up and do what's necessary to keep them safe, I can promise that I and all members on this side of the House will not cease to hold the government to account on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Steelejohn, remotely. Thank you. Uh, President, um, all disabled people who want to be able to get vaccinated, uh, want to get vaccinated, need to be able to do just that, and we need to be able to do it urgently. 
The Morrison government has failed to meet its 1A and 1B targets, and right now there is no plan, no pathway, not even a a trail of breadcrumbs to guide us as a community uh, to how to get vaccinated, uh, to get us all that protection that we need. It is that once again that the disabled community have been abandoned uh, by our government. And once again, the disability community have had to rise, work together and make a clear demand of the government to ensure that we are protected from COVID-19. Uh, the community are calling for a list of actions to be taken immediately, and I want to uh, read them in detail to the Chamber. Uh, first of all, there is a need to urgently develop and implement a clear and publicly available plan to fully vaccinate disabled people, including people in congregate care settings, disabled people over 12, um, and those who are not NDIS participants urgently develop and implement a clear and publicly available plan to vaccinate the close contacts of disabled people, a key aspect that is often missed in these conversations. The release of data uh, each week about the number of disabled people and their close contacts who are vaccinated, uh, the proper provision of PPE and the creation of a dedicated and fully accessible vaccination booking system to ensure that all uh, coal out services are properly uh, promoted so that we can get vaccinated in our place of residence. The Greens will not risk the lives of disabled people uh, and young people and we will ensure that as we move uh, to change the way that we respond that the needs of our community are centred. Senator Steele John, your time has expired. The time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed.